A warm welcome to all of you for plenary session three, a panel discussion with the next generation. The COVID crisis has shown the resilience of family businesses, but the simultaneous churn in the business environment has also put pressure on those to recognize and reorient. In this session, let's hear from the next generation of family business families as to how they can transform and strengthen their legacies. In a session very aptly named Jane Next Transferring Legacies, I'm pleased to welcome on the virtual stage, Mr. CK Ranganathan, Senior Vice President Aima and Chairman and Managing Director, Kevin Care Private Limited, Mr. Shashwat Goenka, Vice Chairman, CESC Limited, Ms. Shifali Munjal, Executive Director, Hero Enterprise, Mr. Alok Kirloska, Managing Director, SPP Pumps Limited, and Mr. Pranjal Sharma, Economic Analyst, Advisor and Writer, and Author India in Automated, and also the moderator of this session. May I now request Mr. Ranganathan to introduce the session. Thanks, Rekha. Good evening, all. It's indeed a great pleasure to introduce uh, this session. Uh, the session is on next-gen transforming legacies. Uh, I'm very happy to introduce you the moderator, Mr. Pranjal Sharma. Uh, he's an economist, uh, economic analyst, advisor and writer, and author of India Automated. He writes several books and he's, a, he's mostly on the kind of technology, how it should be ready. I think that's very, very important. And the books are available in Amazon and hot selling. I would, those who are not read it, I would definitely urge you, this will be a definite eye opener as to how India is going to unfold and how the world is already folding and we should be prepared to. So um, with that note, I think I'm very happy to have three um, scions of the next uh, family business. Um, I'm very happy to introduce uh, Shashwat Goyanka, Vice Chairman, CESC Limited. Um, uh, Ms. Shafali Munjal, Executive Director, Hero Enterprise. Uh, Ms. Alok Kirloskar, Managing Director, SS, SPP Pumps Limited. So this is a very interesting uh, session. I, I would like to give a, just an intro to this session. Is family businesses are generally fared better than the public-owned companies uh, during the COVID crisis. You all know that they have done exceedingly well. Their conservatism with cash speed of decision making uh, and personal ties with stakeholders have allowed them to withstand disruption. While many other companies did, but family owned companies seem to have done much, much better. Uh, however, the next generation of family business leaders are now faced with unprecedented challenges because of the coming disruption from the changes in technologies, business models, trade regimes, policies and regulations. They have to reconcile to the transient nature of modern companies and the demand of durability in a family organization. The next generation has to transform its legacy in order to have a legacy to pass on to the following generation. Therefore, I think if we can answer some of the questions, um, what are the unique challenges and opportunities for the next family business leaders? Uh, I would, I would put it across something. It is a very urgent and this thing is the fourth industrial revolution. Mr. Pranjal is, uh, is a kind of the thing he uh, authored books on that. It will be very interesting to see that, that how the next gen is ready for this kind of a fourth industrial revolution. And another thing, if you look at family business are historically um, person driven. It is built by the first generation entrepreneurs, mostly person driven how well the process driven culture has been set, how this is going to be far more because process only can take it very comfortability to hand over it to the next generation. The next thing I would say that how can families ensure that next generation has the appetite and the ability to transform the legacy business. So a lot of people when they go abroad and say, no, I'm not coming, I'm happy. He's a happy go lucky guy kind of a this thing syndrome, having a lot of money and wealth. The responsibility is also huge with a lot of kind of the thing, the responsibility is much higher. So wanting to take life easy is also we see parallelly a lot of people not interested in family business and wanting to enjoy business and wanting, wanting to enjoy life. So that I think is how the kind of the thing, what, what should the family business do to make them far more interested and take up the mantle. The third one, I would say that should the Scion build a new generation businesses on their own, own, on their own before turning to revolutionize the family business? 
uh, quickly, I think it's a very important question. I can talk about my experience. I have three children. All the three, I said, you have to start something on your own before coming into my, my business. So I told them very limited business, more efforts based and experience is very, very important. I told them one thing very common that I wish you fail. And if you succeed, I'm happy. But if you fail, that will be a biggest teacher because you require to face failure earlier. And I am very happy to say they have all struggled. They had their own ways of struggle and they have come out much more successful. But it took over a five years time. They have found their own feet. They have understood business. The learning is enormous. I don't think they would, had they joined my business, they would have got such kind of help. With that note, I hand it over to Mr. Pranjal Sharma. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ramanathan. That, that's uh, really, very. Thank you. That's very well articulated, especially from your own personal perspective uh, of how you led your children uh, to run the business. I think the, the key points you've said are, are uh, critical. I don't want to uh, dwell on that, but I think the real challenge is that the advantage family businesses have is that they can perhaps take stronger and deeper decisions about the entire group than perhaps a professional uh, company can because they have to go through uh, far more focus on quarterly numbers rather than looking at a 10 or a 25 year perspective. So with that, I, I, let, me, let me bring in uh, the three uh, new generation uh, business science because the growth of their groups now depends on their shoulders. And COVID is actually a moment from where it's, it's a turning point from where the entire way that businesses are run uh, is going to shift. So while you mentioned, Mr. Ranganathan, about the fourth industrial revolution, at the element of COVID where business models have dis been destroyed in, in a matter of months, not years, uh, what happens next? So Shaswat, in your view, you know, from electricity to consumer uh, products to retail uh, to music, even how do you how do you see the challenges for the group? Do you see that you have to now be in a difficult situation of letting go of certain industries and certain businesses, and then focus on new ones? How do you see the whole vision playing out? Sure. Uh, thank you so much, Pran Pranjal, and thanks so much, Mr. Ranganathan, for the warm introduction. Um, so, you know, when I look at the last 12 months, I think it's been nothing short of a roller coaster ride, right? Um, you know, all of that B school education, um, you know, all of the experience you can draw from, uh, from, from all the senior people within the group and elsewhere as well, none of that served as any kind of a blueprint when it came to, you know, navigating the COVID pandemic, right? It, it's something that just came out of nowhere, right? And took everyone by surprise. And, and none of our business models were, were catered towards it. So I think, um, you know, one of the key lessons that I have learned over this period is this whole lesson around resilience, right? Um, in terms of, of, of doing what you're doing, understanding, say specific to retail, understanding the core consumer need and catering to that. And, and, and sometimes some things are done with a long-term view and, and, and the return will come subsequently, right? Um, so I think, and the other very important thing that I kind of learned, and I think that is what I, I really take with me when we look at the next, like you said, the next five, 10, 15 years, is, is this, this whole lesson around agility, right? How quickly can you change what you had in mind, what blueprint you had set for the business, what your expectations and goals were with the changing scenario of not just the economy and the world, but the changing consumer as well, right? Um, and I think so very briefly, agility, resilience, I think are the two things that I believe will be very important as we look forward and, and, and look, look to go ahead, really. Thanks, Shashwat. Uh, Shivali, you know, the question is also about uh, the, you know, COVID has brought everybody to the same level. And as Shashwat mentioned, all the experience of the senior generation of 30, 40 years, perhaps does not uh, apply anymore. Uh, and you have to think completely new uh, in what's going to happen in a post-COVID world. Do you think, Shafali, that, uh, you know, new generation leaders like you are better placed to manage the post-COVID world? Thanks, Pranjal, for the introduction and uh, a warm welcome to everybody else on the panel. Absolutely. COVID, the COVID year has been a massive leveler. It has taught us a lot of lessons. And I agree with Shaswat that resilience and agility is one of the most, two, two of the most important things that we have learned. But uh, what COVID also has done is given us all an opportunity to reflect. You know, we've all had experiences where we've had to close offices or businesses 
ranging from manufacturing to online businesses to uh, be a you know point of sale businesses across the country different parts of the country have got affected at different parts of time you know things like that different businesses in different parts of the world we've not been able to travel abroad to manage manage our businesses abroad either so uh, it's been a great leveler and it's given us a lot of time to reflect now coming to your question pranjal uh there is definitely merit and value in the experience that uh, the older uh, generation as well as you know older employees in the organization bring to us there's definitely a lot of merit and experience and valuable uh, information that they bring to us in terms of how to bring build a brand how to retain brand value how to retain uh, yeah. brand loyalty how to keep the company together how to keep the culture of the company together but as the new generation we have to look at disruption not as anything always negative we have to look at it as this is just another step in the phase where markets are changing and we have to change along with the changes that come towards us it's just that the changes have come towards us at a breakneck speed and we've had to adapt to them i with, with very varied uh, responses in different industries for example in the manufacturing sector which which i have some uh, interests in we've had to respond to that with you know working out how do we prevent covid in the factory environment on the point of sale business across the country we've had to see which markets can we keep open when and how do we digitize fast enough so that we we don't have to have a face to face interaction necessarily for everything on other sides of the consulting business we've seen a hit where trainers for example if you're in the training business like which one of the businesses that i'm in is the training business we can't actually send trainers to offices and uh, factories anymore because they're shut so how do we digitize fast enough so that we can get everybody online so it's been a great leveler but it's also been been a great opportunity to learn and see how fast is it that we can react how fast is it? and that is the real value i think gen next can bring to this because one we've got education we've got experience we've got the blessings and the support of the elders in our families in terms of professionals who've been there for 20 30 40 years as you mentioned or we've got you know the guidance of uh, older family members we've got the experience of you know uh, all of their joint experience together but what we have really have to do is move very very fast thanks shivali uh, alok coming to you um, you know investing in new technology is a difficult decision because it also means you have to put away whatever you have invested in previous years so what do you do with legacy technology and how do you bring in new technology and that transition is very difficult for large enterprises which are running different business models across different geographies and uh, different verticals um how have you managed this uh, alok and in, in the kirloskar brothers group including the company that you run um thank you mr ranganathan for the initial introduction and uh, ranjal to answer your question i would say that uh, i mean the change and the challenges we are talking about uh, have been in the in the making possibly for the last decade and uh, and you know the definition of a product Uh, has been changing uh, over the last decades especially for us in manufacturing uh, you see it uh, a lot more now in the automotive industry but i mean just to give you an example uh, rolls royce moved to the concept of power by the hour for their jet engines uh, more than a decade ago where you know they would sell the engines for not very much money but make mo- make money every time you're using the aircraft as an example uh i mean netflix if you look at the other example has moved out of uh, dvd sales uh into uh, you know renting dvds and finally into the online presence on a subscription basis as you see it today and and we find the change in our industry as well uh as you possibly know we've discussed this before uh, knowledge management has been very important to us uh as a old company you know we lose uh, you know whenever we lose people people who've been with us for a long time with a lot of knowledge uh we feel that we are losing uh you know information and uh, and our ability to make changes in the business very quickly because there are things like you know warranty different kinds of things that they have learned that are in their heads which may not necessarily be owned by the company uh, i don't know if you want to call it ip or you know whatever you want to call it but uh, but it's it's information like that that's uh, that needs to be documented 
um, you know, and so, you know, all these things, you know, what, you know, who, what is a product, uh, what are employees supposed to be doing now, because the kind of employees you're recruiting are different. Uh, you know, back in the day, you know, in the license Raj, the role of employees was very different from what the role of employees is today. Uh, you know, today we want people who will make changes, who are going to be thinking to lead the company forward, who are taking initiatives and driving the company themselves uh, with, uh, of course, uh, uh, interaction with uh, the people you're calling promoters today in companies uh, and, and guidance and ideas and idea sharing with promoters. Uh, but I would say that a lot of these people have to move forward themselves. And today you need technologies that support all these things together, you know, things, whether it's AI, whether it's 3D printing, whether it's managing KPIs uh, for co companies, for all your employees around, uh, across your companies uh, and connecting them to your vision and mission statements. Because people today have the requirement to want to understand what is their contribution to the company. And if they're not able to see that very visibly, uh, they get demotivated. So I think these technologies are important. Yes, they're technologies that companies invested in the past. Uh, and it's not that they're obsolete. They're, they're, at, they're operating at a lower level. Uh, you know, whether you're talking about CNC machines, uh, you're talking about, uh, you know, industry 3.0, of course, there's industry 4.0, but that's just sensors on top of what you already had. So I don't think that something's been phased out or something's obsolete or something's written off. Uh, but I do believe that there is a transition to the next, next generation of products, uh, which may not be a product as we are selling to someone else today. It could be as a subscription and, and a different way of managing people because uh, you know, it's, it's changed completely and how you interact with people has changed completely. Uh, for me, I think being uh, in the US and, in, and, and managing companies in, in the US and in uh, the UK has helped me understand, a lot, understand that a lot more and help me understand you know, what sort of systems need to be brought in into, into the companies in India to sort of have that same level of collaboration and have that same level of uh, you know, uh, accountability along with the authority. I hope, I hope that answers the question you are answering, uh, asking me. I look, it, it explains a lot. And I think the, the focus that your company and the group has had on technologies is you know, at, at a global world-class level. And I think that's also making sure that the group is ready for changes at a much faster pace. And, and that's what Shafali referred to as well. But coming to you, Shashwat, uh, the, you know, you also represent a group which has been, been there for generations. Now, typically, once a business model is set in any vertical or industry, it sort of stays there or it used to stay there for 15 years, 20 years, perhaps, you know, at a minimum of 10 years. Today, we are looking at a situation where a business model needs to disrupt itself in next in three years. Uh, at least, maybe in two years. Uh, and, and the new emergence of such business model means that business promoters, family owners have to be equally agile. And agile also means taking very difficult decisions, which means to say, I'm going to shut down this and I'm going to start something completely new because this is not going to work. It may be working at 50%, but if I don't end it now, I will not be able to move to the new one. Are there examples in your experience where you had to take these tough decisions where you realize that being on top of new emerging business models is perhaps a challenge which uh, the previous generations never faced? So, I mean, yes, you need to be on top of these kind of situations, Pranjal, but, but I, I disagree with you. I think every generation that's come before me has faced it as well, right? Uh, when I see examples from my grandfather, from my father, you know, and, and when you see how the group has grown, it's been a combination of growing um, greenfield businesses as well as a few brownfield ventures that we acquired and, and letting go of some businesses that didn't work, right? So in the 90s, we used to have this Cellucom business called RPG Cellucom, right? Which didn't work and did not work for the model we had. So we had to let go of it. Similarly, um, you know, much earlier, we used to have a tire company Dunlop as well, which did not work at that point in time. So you have to let go of it, right? Um, similar things have happened across even now, and say, when I look at my experience, I've not really faced it at, at a company level yet, but, but there have been departments that we've had to say, okay, this, this particular strategy or this particular function that this department was supposed to serve is not serving anymore. We need to move on with it. Okay, what was invested, sunk cost, move on, right? And, and they have been difficult. They have been tough calls. They've been areas, say, that we've been passionate about and we've always believed will work and help the business proactively. But if they haven't served their purpose, you have to move on and you have to, you have to, and, and this, this is the whole thing around being agile, right? It's not about 
making decisions quick and changing your decisions quickly, but really being able to understand what 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 gives you that long term shareholder value and moving on from that. True, sir. Sure. But it also means, and I'll, I'll ask Shivali for this. Sometimes companies need to completely let go of what their core was, and there are several examples globally. IBM, for example, is is a good uh, a company which used to be a laptop provider to a services provider, right? So, Shivali, do you see those kind of attitudes? uh becoming far more central where business leaders and new generation will have to completely think out of the box and say well my group may have been known for a b c d but i'm going to lead it to x y z yes absolutely i think uh, you have to be one step ahead of the disruption and the disruption now is coming at a breakneck speed whether it's a digital company that's going to outsell you or on a consumer product that you traditionally sold on points of sales or through dealerships or whether it's a digital company, company or, or a com- com- combination tech startup which you know does training better than you you have to be a one step ahead of the disruption so there are four choices one you can part, become part of the disruption secondly you can undermine the disruption thirdly you can contain the disruption or you can fourthly exit all together but i don't think exiting all together a legacy business which has a brand which has value which has goodwill is a very sensible idea in the long term so we have to find one of the three first initial uh, responses which is either to undermine it to contain it or to get one step ahead of it and that can only happen when we bring in a lot of good talent and good resources into our businesses there is a, as i said you know a lot of value and a lot of learning that comes with uh, the elder generation but as education is available now we see a lot more mbas we see a lot more ed- overseas educated uh, you know guys coming into the scene we, we i do feel that if you hire the right kind of talent we can overcome a lot of these challenges which perhaps an older generation may take a longer time to do than we would I hope that answers it. Yes, it does. It does. Uh, Alok, I think it also ties in with what you are saying, and I think in some ways all three of you uh, have the same level of uh, uh, you know maturity and forward-looking ideas about what the group means. Uh, but Alok, you know, you you did refer to the teams as well, making the transitions of the teams. But uh, today, even mid-level companies have a global perspective, right? So at one level, you're talking about. Uh, Uh, the fourth industrial revolution second we're talking about the change in uh, covid led business models and for third we're talking about a global perspective which starts even with the smallest company in the group now how do you plan for uh, for all these things when you look at growth for the next 3 years now uh, again sooner or later you will have the entire weight of the group on your shoulders uh, uh, alok so does that also put too much pressure on the next gen or do you think there is you are ready for it and the next gen actually will be able to manage faster and better the whole concept of agility and being able to tough, take tough decisions uh, pranjal i think that really depends on how the next generation is inducted into the business and you know for if for, for me i'll give you my own example i mean my father in, in, uh, sort of inducted us uh, both me and my sister uh, not at the top end of the business but at the bottom end of the business and uh, and that really allowed us to uh, understand the business uh, meet customers meet our own employees and you know uh, very often uh, feel the pain along with them right and uh, and while you could feel the play pain you always knew that you know since you always have the option of changing that what would you change right and uh, and very often the answer is no, the, the 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 decision or the action is not as simple as it you know as it seems because you know there are other complications because of course when you're interacting with people it's a different employee that you're working with at that point in time they only see it from their department or their division point of view and not necessarily as a company point of view and while you are in their department working with them uh, you still have that view of the whole company and and it helps you understand you know what if you have to make a change how do you make that change that you know works for the whole company not just for a division or a department and uh, and i think definitely feeling that pain is important 
because you need to feel that pain, you need to feel desperation, uh, you need to have that sinking feeling, and and then that makes you run a little faster. So, so I would say that's definitely important. And and the global question that you asked me, yes, every company has aspirations to be global, but I don't think that means every company needs to be global. I think at the end of the day, a company uh, needs to deliver return to its shareholders, and. Uh, and one needs to figure out that you know are you better suited being in india and delivering better returns or is your business so international that you need to uh, you know have operations in different countries because maybe you depend on understanding where the technology is moving and there may be western countries that are sort of moving technology and you are and you having a presence there allows you to be ahead of the curve because you know where the technology is moving towards uh, or it could be because uh, you know you want to be based in different countries to hedge your risks uh, because I think now it's becoming more and more expensive to be based in different countries overseas, especially because of various uh, trade barriers. I think more and more countries want uh, local content. And at one time you could make in India and just export. And that was a great model. But I think today, uh, you know, different countries, the US included, are putting in all sorts of local value addition requirements. And and so that the, there's a change now in how you're going to de how you're going to sort of operate because you need to have a local presence, which means you need to have local people, and you need to be able to understand, interact, manage all those different cultures. So I think uh, it's it's going it's going to be a different transition, and it's uh, it's going to be uh, more difficult than just being an export oriented company going forwards. True, but I think all three of you and most of the new generation is far more global today in its culture in its outlook and its experiences than previously. But now let us let me ask a personal question to all three of you. Uh, and this is, I'm really building on a very brilliant uh, opening that uh, Mr. Ranganathan gave to me. So I'm going to ask you, Shashwat, uh, Shafali, and Alok about, you know, the first key challenge that you faced, uh, which was probably given to you by your, by your parents or the earlier generation uh, to earn your spurs, to be able to earn the right to be uh, growing in the company and take leadership position. So if you can share a story, each of you, it'll be wonderful because, you know, it'll, it'll be great learning for all of us as well and the audience who's listening in. So Shashwat, if you can share sure. a story of, of sure. how, uh, how you cracked one of your first or the toughest nut that you had. Sure. Um, so so contrary to uh, say how Alok's induction in the business was, right? Mine was very different. It was trial by fire, uh, thrown into the deep end, leading that company, not knowing anything about Indian retail, not knowing anything about or much about the Indian consumer beyond being one myself. Um, so you have to start again. You know, you'll have to start, uh, Shashwat, in sense, which company, when was it? How did Okay, it sorry. Yeah, cool. Um, so talking about Spencer's Retail, right? Uh, which is the retail company running hypermarkets and supermarkets across the country. Um, so, so I didn't really start down below in the ranks. I got an exposure across departments and then I was thrown right into the deep end uh, where you were heading this. You had a lot of senior people who had been working with the group and with the company for years who were now suddenly reporting into you. Also, obviously, in their heads, figuring out what is this 22-year-old going to be doing here? Why are we reporting into him? Uh, what value can he possibly add? He stayed out of the school, no experience, nothing, right? Um, so I think my first challenge, and, and, and it's not really a business challenge, but it was more a challenge in terms of how I dealt with people, was really how do you try and, well, Establish is the wrong word, but how do you try and get your point across to a bunch of people who've been doing this forever, who know retail, they are the experienced experience people in retail. How do you get your point across to them without, you know, it being the fact that, okay, just because you are their boss or because you are a promoter or, or just because you have a wacky idea out there that nobody else has, right? And, and I think uh, that was my biggest challenge is sitting in that boardroom, trying to work with all of these senior leaders, trying to figure how to put my point, point across. And I think the one thing that, that dad helped me with actually, and, and that really worked and, and, and works for me today today is really this whole thing around, don't make a point for the sake of making it, use logic and make that point. And, and, and your point is not always the right point. There could be an alternative logic which somebody else may have. Work it out, debate it out and do what's best ultimately for the business and the shareholder, right? And, and I think that's the principle I've followed through and through. And, and I think that's really what kind of helped me break that initial barrier with them, where, where they realize that, that uh, you know, I'm as much part of the team as they are. I'm not, not there to, to reprimand them, but to work with them. And jointly, all of us are there to work towards the same end goal, right? So. 
I can imagine how difficult it could have been for you as a 20 year old, 22 year old to be telling people, well, you know, how about looking at it this way? It's a, it's a classic uh, transition challenge. Shifali, what about you? As Mr. Ranganathan said in his opening statement, he wants his children to fail first before they succeed. And uh, very similar to Shashwat, I had a very uh, similar experience. My dad literally said, here's the deep end, learn how to sink or swim. And I jumped in uh, again, straight out of business school at the age of 22. Which business, similar to which business was this? I was, at, I was in the software company and started a software company called HeroSoft. And uh, we basically were an SAP and a Microsoft Navision implementer. And the sector that we normally naturally chose was the automotive sector because we had business interests in that. We had experience. We could get domain knowledge from our own business conglomerate for the domain for the domain of the auto sector. So uh, literally jumped into that and uh, uh, basically uh, ran that business for about five or six years before we realized that uh, a we're losing talent very very quickly because. Obviously, this was a specific domain, and we did we did win awards. We we did good implementations, but we lost a lot of the talent. We were unable to also subsequently open offices overseas, which would have brought in the revenues to actually run the business. So that was my first learning, and that was I think uh, I, we we eventually had to close down that business and t- transform it into a consulting company to, to keep the legacy uh, carry, carry the legacy forward. But uh, that was a very, very major learning for me in, in my early to mid twenties, and a real introduction into how the world the world of business works. So it wasn't all it wasn't all roses and a bed of roses, and I didn't really have a choice. But this is something I chose to do. I said, okay, I'm going to take the challenge. I'm going to take it head on. I'm going to roll with this. I'm going to see where it goes. How how much appetite do I have for risk? How much appetite does the family have? to invest in me for my risk that I want to take. And I have to say that it was a phenomenal experience because the family did support me. My dad did support me. And I grew and I learned a lot from the experience. Subsequently, the businesses that I set up after that or the business that I got involved in running, I looked at it in a very different way. I looked at it from a perspective of what markets am I going to get? Where am I going to have my strengths? Where am, where do my weaknesses lie? How do I prevent people from getting poached? How do I dis, how do I prevent getting disrupted by disruption? And that I think is a skill that has come in very handy now, in a time of COVID, in a time of a pandemic where the entire world is going, you know, haywire. How do you have the skills to cope with this without falling apart, without letting your businesses fall apart, and with keeping the legacy or the brand? or what, however you name it, there are many, many labels for the same word, legacy, brand, goodwill. How do you keep it all together while everything is, you know, in a situation where it might actually not stay together for very long? So I think the initial learnings that I had growing up in the family business and then on my own as an entrepreneur really helped me in shaping up, uh, you know, to deal with what, what we have to deal with today. Thank you, Shivali. Alok, how was your uh, trial by fire? <laughs> trial by fire. I would say a, a lot of fire, if you ask me. <laughs> I, you know, after I was inducted in the Indian business, my father uh, said, you know, I think, uh, you know, being in the Indian business is one thing, but, you know, given that we want to be international, uh, you know, I think you should go abroad. And so he sent me uh, to the UK business. And uh, the UK business has operations in the UK, uh, Netherlands, South Africa, and Thailand, and America. And, uh, you know, when we acquired these businesses, I mean, one of our focuses had been on the oil and gas segments, because in India, we were not particularly strong in this segment. And so all the businesses we acquired were in were pumps, of course, for the oil and gas segment. And when I went there, uh, I realized that very soon after I got there, there was the, the collapse in the oil prices, as you remember, massive collapse in the oil prices, especially in 2014. And, uh, and suddenly all the businesses that were acquired were basically didn't have any business, right? Effectively, they were making huge losses. And, uh, and, and it was, uh, uh, you know, initially you're, you're thinking, you know, should I get into this market, that market? Uh, it, was, uh, it was a struggle for many reasons. One was, it was the businesses were short of cash. So cash flow was a big issue. Uh, we had, uh, you know, 
a, a big issue in in South Africa because South Africa has things like broad uh, broad based black based black empowerment rules. You know where you need to have a business that's black empowered, which we were not, which also came into effect at the same time, unfortunately. And um, the, the third issue was, you know, how do we restructure the businesses? Because, uh, you know, as you're aware, I mean, restructuring businesses in Europe is extremely expensive. Uh, and uh, when you have no money, it's even more expensive. So, uh, so I think that was something that we had to sort of work our way out of. And, uh, and we, we really, it was, diff and it was difficult from a people point of view, you know, because obviously you're very young. The people there are much, much older than you. The senior management is in their 50s, late 50s, uh, and, and most many, some of them even in their 60s. Uh, and so, you know, changing that direction uh, is not that easy. Your last name doesn't have the same sway that it does in India. Uh, so it's, it's, it, was a, it, was a, it was a huge task getting them on board, uh, convincing them where you want to go. And, and, and ensuring they stop spending money because, you know, one of the key things I learned was the real importance of cash flow and, and, you know, conserving cash, but also ensuring understanding the movement of cash through your business. Uh, and that is really where, you know, I think uh, for me personally, that was a huge area of growth. Um, it also included uh, recruiting new people because, you know, the, some of the businesses never made money uh, in these, in, you know, like a Thai business as an example back then. And, uh, and so, you know, changing leadership, et cetera, in this difficult time, getting people on board, uh, you know, people from the competition on board, uh, when your numbers really don't give them confidence that they should be with you. So, uh, so I think that, and we got many people on board and, you know, we were able to turn almost all those businesses around in the last, uh, last couple of years, uh, except for our Dutch business, which is still very difficult for us. Uh, so I would say it was very difficult, a lot of learning, uh, a lot of hair loss, <laughs> also, <laughs> and, and, but, but it helped me understand, uh, you know, really how to interact with, uh, you know, various cultures, uh, how do you get the best out of them, and also the understanding the system, the labor laws in Europe, because the labor laws in Europe are very difficult, but if you understand how they work, uh, they, they, they can be made to work for you. So I think that, you know, there are a lot of learnings, learnings over there. And, uh, and but, but I would say my number one learning was, you know, managing cash in the business and keeping people motivated because, you know, finally people are the business. And if you have a very high attrition rate or if you have demotivated people, you know, your business is really going to nosedive. So, you know, how do you keep people motivated when the numbers are bad? And, and how do you ensure your business doesn't run out of cash? Because I mean, that's the, you know, like, so, like I, think, I think it was GM who said this, that you know businesses don't go bankrupt because they don't they because they make little less profit they, they go bankrupt because they have no cash and i think that's really uh, that's really the key learning over there that's well said uh, look i think cash and when you talk about people i also want to take a larger phrase for it which is culture i think cash and culture of the group really makes a huge difference you know i've got a couple of questions from the uh, audience uh, one is from Shantanu. He's talking about sustainability of non-digital companies, but it triggered a thought about the larger issue. You know, one one issue which you all as new generation have to face is about sustainability. Now, sustainability or what is called ESG environment, sustainability governance was not something which was top priority for previous generations. It is it has become in recent times, but for, for three of you and for the next generation of business leaders, it will be right in the center uh, uh, of, of everything that you do. Um, in your view, uh, is, is that complicating the growth path or is it something that you think companies will have to uh, take in stride? So I'll request all three of you to respond to that, especially with, with regard to how you are interpreting it and leading it for your group. Shashwa? Fair. Um, so, so I completely agree, Pranjal. I think going forward, this is going to become important, not just for consumers, especially for us as consumer-facing businesses, but even for our investors, right? And, and I think rightly so. And I think the one thing that the pandemic has taught us all is, is we cannot take the environment for granted, right? Um, um, so, so I think uh, it will become important. No, I don't think it will deter or slow growth. In fact, I think it will help growing and growing in the right ways, right? Um, and, and so therefore, I think it's something that I'm very proactive about. I'm very happy about. And I believe it can go a long way, you know. 
Shafali? I'll answer a different part of the same question, whereas Shashwat has thrown light on the, eco econo the ecological sustainability of consumer businesses. I would rather talk about the risk compliance and governance aspect, which I think uh, with the regulators coming in for almost all the consumer facing and non-consumer facing industries, I think it's very important today for businesses to be compliant. I think I put, I personally put a lot of importance on risk and governance. And uh, I think going forward, it will help overall industry and all new businesses emerging to have a level playing field to start with. So I think governance and sustainability goes hand in hand. And uh, I'm pretty happy that, uh, you know, it, it's become a topic of discussion now and it's a topic of importance. Now. Hello. Uh, Pranjal, I think governance and, uh, and ethics, uh, you know, are, uh, are absolutely important for sustainability of the business. Uh, I mean, you will have businesses that, you know, just gr grow like a meteor because of various things they do. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think it's about sustainability. And I think all the people you have right now on the panel are from very old businesses, you know, who are known for their ethics. And, and, uh, and that's really what has driven the sustainability of their businesses. I mean, they've not always been number one in the country, but, you know, they have always been around in the country and been of imp importance and, and made a difference in the country. And I think that's, that's really what, I mean, that's the result of the fact that, you know, what ethics, what sustainable governance really means that, you know, it allows the business to, to, uh, to continue. And it connects to, you know, a very important point you made earlier about culture, because, you know, the culture of the business and the culture of the promoters extends into the culture of the people. And, uh, and they, they notice everything that, you know, the promoters of the business are doing. And, and that extends into how they interact with the company, how they interact with our customers, how they interact with our suppliers. And if you want a sustainable business, I mean, for your own self as a business owner, I mean, you need to ensure that you have good governance over the long term. I would say environment uh, is absolutely important for us and it, and it should be important for most businesses. I mean, some businesses, of course, will could be hurt by becoming more and more environmentally friendly because you know they were just in businesses that May, may not be environmentally friendly and the transition to become an environmentally friendly business would mean you know change in their revenue profile change in their margin profiles uh, but in the long term i think yes you have to be environmentally friendly i mean we have taken it on board and we look at things like fish friendly pumps as an example uh, or you know getting our our energy from you know green sources uh, so i mean it's it's absolutely important and i mean that's the trend because you know if we want to go you know con do not want to contribute towards global warming and you know all those kinds of things uh, we have to change the business we're in and if we don't change uh, you know we'll probably be out of business because today investors uh, uh, and even you know the general stakeholders want to be a part of companies and support companies that are environmentally friendly no actually the if, if you look at it the the growth matrix and the influencing uh, uh, forces on new generation is are far more complex <clears throat> in many ways than before. But Mr. Ranganathan, if I can come to you, I'll just take this. Mr. Ranganathan, the you know after hearing all three of them, um, do you feel that the new generation is actually as capable as we know that they are? Uh, are there certain uh, you know thoughts that you have on what advice they should take on on a you know, idea that we may have missed out because, you know, if you look at the way they have approached issues from environmental uh, concern to technology, they're on the ball. No, absolutely. I think I'm, I'm very happy to see that the next, uh, next generation are far more equipped than otherwise normally expected. I think they are very well equipped to take on the business to the next level. And I think the current generation should be happy to hand over the mantle uh, without delaying it too much is what my viewpoint. <laughs> people can learn on the book. Thank you. So, uh, you know, with this, I'd like to end the session and thank uh, Shashwat Shufali, Alok and Mr. Ranganathan for, for sharing your experiences, your ideas and your learnings. Uh, and I can, I can say very confidently that uh, with the representation of leaders like you, uh, the future of corporate India is in very safe hands. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.